Do we have the official time? My, my watch says one o'clock. So mm -hmm. yep. All right. Well, then. Well, Andrew's maybe the person to ask, I guess. He's the one. <laughs> yes, that's right. <my laughs> Let's do it. Great. Well, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're very excited to welcome Andrew Latlo as today's speaker. Andrew um, is with NIST in Boulder and leads the optical lattice clock projects there um, within the time and frequency division. He's one of the pioneers in his field and received prestigious prizes and awards. In fact, every time there's a new clock record, there's a good chance that his group is involved. Um, Andrew got his undergrad degree from Brigham Young University and then came to Jilla in Boulder to work for his PhD in Junier's lab um, on the development or evaluation of a strontium lattice clock. This was um, a big success story and um, Andrew received in 2009 the Deborah Jin Demo Thesis Prize for this work. He then moved on to um, NIST as an NSC postdoc uh, where he later started his own group and they focus among other things on Terbium optical lattice clocks. And that's what he's also going to talk about today. Andrew, the stage is yours. Great. Well, it's uh, it's great to be with you. And uh, thanks for the introduction and the chance to, uh, to share a message uh, this afternoon. Um, so all um, uh, my talk today will focus on some new techniques uh, that we've been working with on cooling and quantum control. Uh, to ultimately work towards uh, the next generation of optical lattice clocks that can have um, even higher performance than what they're capable of today. All right, so to start with, I just wanted to say um, a word or two about the atomic species that uh, we mostly think about and, and work with uh, for the optical clocks. Um, in particular for the optical lattice clock, it's, it's these divalent uh, atoms that are most interesting to us. So they have two valence electrons. And the structure of having those, uh, those two electrons really uh, gives us some unique features to take advantage of and uh, some control opportunities. So um, these two valence systems, right, those, those two electrons uh, can spin pair either in singlet or triplet, triplet configurations. And in, in principle, uh, there's uh, no electric dipole allowed transitions between those. And so uh, we typically have the structure where there's a bunch of uh, singlet states uh, with strong transitions between them that are useful for stuff like laser cooling. And then the triplet states, also you can have uh, some strong transitions for some various cooling or control. Uh, and um, for the most part, there's not a lot of coupling between them, but there are some high order effects like uh, uh, fine interactions or hyperfine interactions that do uh, allow for some weak E1 transitions between the singlet and triplet states. And those that are more strongly allowed are useful for laser cooling like this, uh, this, this green transition here. Um, and uh, those that are less weakly allowed are useful for very high precision laser spectroscopy, like this yellow transition. And that's, this is the, the clock transition that mostly gets exploited uh, in optical lattice clocks. It's between the ground state, which is a singlet, and the very first excited state, which is a metastable triplet state. So this, this same kind of structure um, can be taken advantage of in a lot of different contexts. And so for that reason, these types of atoms are used in a variety of different experiments. For the most part, uh, historically, um, a lot of the activity began with um, group 2A elements uh, like uh, calcium, strontium, maybe magnesium or barium. Um, and more recently, there's been growing interest in the group 2B atoms uh, like zinc, cadmium or mercury. And today, mostly what I'll talk about is uh, ytterbium. Of course, all of these atoms have these two valence electrons. The two Bs, they also, in addition, have a closed D shell and our ytterbium atom will have a closed F shell, but it doesn't really change in, in any meaningful way right now, the, the structure that we're talking about here with these single and triplet states. 
So the optical lattice clock uh, uses these divalent atoms at their heart. And to maybe give a little bit of introduction about the lattice clock, I wanted to take a brief look at some of the important foundations uh, that lattice clocks are built on. One could say that there are three pillars uh, that all optical lattice clocks take advantage of uh, in order to operate at very high levels of performance. There's the pillar of optical coherence. Uh, there's one of quantum control. And then finally, one of precision measurement. And I'll just say a brief word or two about each one of, of those. So first in the optical coherence, we've already talked about the, the structure that gives us this, the singlet and, and triplet states, and that the lowest line uh, of each of those um, are both long-lived states, and uh, there is a very weakly allowed E1 transition between those states, and that is our clock transition. Typically, this excited triplet state might have a lifetime of many seconds uh, or more, and so we can coherently drive this transition and just watch the phase of the electron wave function evolve, and that can serve as the time base of our clock as, as we just count away the radians and uh, because we can do so for so long uh, with, with this high coherence, it really gives us very high precision for, for that type of a measurement. So uh, in Euterbium, that transition uh, has been measured uh, very well uh, out to these digits shown here. And that's one important ingredient in making this uh, a useful clock system. Of course, in order to actually drive this highly coherent transition, you need a highly coherent laser field. And so there's been a lot of activity um, in the optical clock community at trying to make ever more stable, ever more coherent optical sources. Uh, and I'm showing a, a picture of a few examples. Uh, for example, here is uh, the work by PTB and Jilla at developing a cryogenically cooled uh, silicon cavity uh, that currently offers the highest coherence uh, of an optical field. All right, so looking now at the pillar of quantum control. Uh, so, you know, a, a important detail for this structure, this atomic structure to be useful in any way to us is that these atoms essentially be, you know, nominally at rest or at least trapped, let's say. Um, and uh, for us, the optical lattice is what enables that. So trap these atoms in a magic wavelength optical lattice where they're confined in the Lambdicky regime. That tight confinement is really important because it eliminates motional effects like uh, the Doppler shift or Doppler broadening that would otherwise uh, completely frustrate uh, the high precision laser spectroscopy at the heart of these systems. It also holds on to the atoms for us, so it enables us to interrogate them for long periods of time where let's say you know gravity is not pulling them down uh, out out of view of, of of our measurement system so that's another important detail and finally these optical lattices are at the magic wavelength and this is maybe one of the most special uh, details the fact that the light atom interaction is able to trap the atoms in this tight regime but that the interaction can be identical for the two clock states of interest, this, this ground singlet state and this lowest line uh, triplet metastable state. The light shift for both of those states is identical, so it cancels to first order. So we kind of get the best of both worlds in that we can hold on to the atoms, but that we can also uh, not strongly perturb the, the transition that we're trying to measure. Finally, it's important that the atoms uh, sit at ultra cold temperatures. Uh, in our lattice, this has the useful effect of suppressing uh, tunneling between lattice sites, and that can lead to residual emotional effects that also frustrate um, laser spectroscopy. Also, the cold temperatures um, benefit us in suppressing interactions among the atoms trapped in a lattice site that could otherwise yield strong shifts that perturb our measurement of the clock transition frequency. And it does so to first order, we take advantage of quantum statistics here. Mostly we're using isotopes of these two valence atoms that are fermionic. And if we cool them down, we can freeze out uh, P, uh, P wave collision channels. And Fermi statistics dictate that these, these identical fermions don't like to interact 
on even wave collision channels. And so we can really strongly suppress interactions among, among the atoms. And finally, the, the ultra cold temperatures uh, really give us uh, the, the chance to, to trap the atoms in a very uniform way. And I'll say more about that in a little bit. And then finally, on the kind of pillar of, of precision measurement, there's a lot of things that in order to reach high levels of accuracy, you just need to control the system really well and pr precisely characterize some of the important effects impacting the operation. And a good example of this is uh, the black body Stark shift. So this is uh, one of the most prominent um, shifts that perturbs the clock transition. And uh, in order to deal with this, um, you know, in, in our euterbium lattice clock, we do all of the laser cooling trapping, all the laser spectroscopy inside uh, a black body shield black body shield is pictured here, um, where basically there's um, uh, this copper structure that's at a uniform temperature that's lined with um, some type of high emissive, high, excuse me, high emissivity coating like carbon nanotubes uh, that basically give an ideal uh, black body uh, so that we can very precisely characterize, calculate what the radiative environment is that's bathing the atoms and account for the effect. So that's kind of an important detail. All right, so putting that all together, uh, optical lattice clocks today can realize um, measurement uncertainty at really high levels. So here is a table of the important systematic effects impacting our euterbium lattice clock at NIST. And um, the uncertainties associated with these are all expressed in fractional units of the clock transition frequency. And you can see kind of the take home messages that clocks today are able to operate at uh, a part in 10 to the 18. Or in other words, we in principle could make measurements with an uncertainty out to 18 digits of precision. So just to kind of put that in context, that level corresponds in principle to the same fraction as measuring the age of the universe and being able to do so with an uncertainty at um, the half second level. So we have two of these euterbium lattice clocks at NIST and We've both characterized them at that same level. And lo and behold, if we actually make measurements between the two clock systems, we can show that the, we get the same uh, clock frequency between them at that level of uncertainty at, at one part in 10 to the 18. And that's what we're showing here is the difference between those two at, at, at less than that level. Another important figure of merit for how good these clocks are today is the stability. So this basically just gives the statistical uncertainty associated with measurements uh, with these clock systems. And, and of course, that generally improves as you average over longer periods of a measurement. And uh, for these clocks, we might have something like a part in 10 to the 16 at a second of measurement. And if you average down long enough uh, towards hours or days, you can get down to uh, 10 to the minus 18 or, or even better. Just to put that into context, I've also kind of plotted up here that uh, an, an uncertainty that I'm calling the gravitational uncertainty on Earth, um, which really speaks to how it can be difficult to actually usefully take advantage of this level of precision here on Earth. So I'll just say a quick word about that. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, our, uh, the evolution of time or our measurement of time can be impacted by relativistic effects um, in particular, general relativity dictates that you know, time evolves slower uh, deep in a gravitational potential. Um, the comparison of atomic clocks in the past reveals that you know, this effect is, is kind of well understood and, 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 and can nominally be, be measured and needs to be taken into account. Anytime we uh, transmit uh, atomic clock signals across Earth or maybe from a satellite down to Earth. So uh, here in uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, at NIST, uh, we've, uh, there, there's been a, a careful characterization of what the geopotential is here locally, trying to relate it to uh, the kind of uh, conventional reference point for geopotential, the, the, the geoid near uh, sea level. And uh, basically using the kind of best techniques available so far, that's been able to be uh, done at a geopotential uncertainty corresponding to six centimeters of elevation change. And in clock units in our fractional frequency, that corresponds to six times 10 to the minus 18. 
And so what that means is that in principle, if we wanted to transmit our clock uh, signal uh, you know, to somewhere else on earth and use it, even though here locally we could realize 10 to the minus 18 uncertainty, it would be difficult for us to realize that same uncertainty somewhere else because of these gravitational effects. But of course, the clocks themselves might present a solution to this challenge that the clocks can be used in order to measure the, the geopotential uh, more precisely than what can be done now. And that's this idea of relativistic geodesy uh, that folks have been anticipating for decades that these clocks could might be able to play a useful role in this. And now that the clocks are finally at this level of performance, there is an opportunity to really impact this ge uh, geodesy field. All right, finally, um, you know, whether we're talking about things like geodesy or other applications that atomic clocks have historically played an important role in, as we improve the performance of these clocks, we have the opportunity to improve some of the application spaces that they make an impact, whether that's uh, some of the technology applications I have listed here, some of the metrology applications just trying to define better our concept of the second, or using these clock systems as sensitive probes of fundamental physics, like searching for dark matter or trying to look for variation in the fundamental constants of nature. Okay, so with that as uh, maybe some background, uh, today I'd really like to focus um, our time together uh, talking about um, efforts that we've made recently to try to improve techniques that allow for better cooling or quantum control as we look towards how to make these clock systems better than what we can do now. Not 10 to the minus 18, but we'd like to do 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 20, or, or even better. All right, so with that, I'll focus on some, some discussions of trying to use the clock transition itself as a mechanism for, for cooling deeply into the nano-Kelvin regime. And there's a couple of different cooling mechanisms that we'll explore. And I'll also talk a little bit about coherent delocalization in order to discourage unwanted collisions between the atoms. Um, it will take some time as we kind of talk through those. If we have any time left towards the end, I'll also say uh, a few brief words about um, efforts that we've made recently to try to reduce the black body shift, as well as some efforts to try to get these uh, clocks outside the laboratory to do some interesting things with them, things that can't be done with them uh, when you're stuck inside the lab. Um, and if we don't get time for that uh, today, we'll, uh, we'll save it for another day, but we'll just see how, how time goes. All right, so um, looking again at the, our uncertainty budget uh, for these, these systems, I said before that you can reach this one part in 10 to the 18 level. Well, as you kind of look in a little bit more detail about what things play the most prominent role, you typically see that there's at least two effects that are most substantial. One is the black body shift that I alluded to already. And the other is uh, basically light shifts associated with the atoms being trapped in an optical lattice. Um, historically, these two things have, have played an important role since the very beginning of lattice clocks. So just looking back a decade to the uncertainty budget for um, our first euterbium lattice uh, uh, clock system uh, here at NIST, um, or at least our first fermionic uh, species, you can see that also the biggest uncertainties back then were black body radiation shift and lattice effects. Now here the units are part in 10 to the 16 rather than part in 10 to the 18. So we've made progress, but it's still the same things. And then I'll just take a semi-random sampling of uh, some other uh, uh, optical lattice clocks. So there's dozens of these being developed around the world. And here's an example of some uncertainty budgets from Tokyo, from Jilla, and from PTB in Germany. And you can see that prominently in all of these um, uh, lattice light shifts as well as black body shift play an important role. So these have, have been with us for a long time. And as we dive deeper and deeper into these systems, they have a way of showing up time and time again. And so these are really important details for us. All right, so um, as, as we start talking about uh, lattice light effects, uh, so let's look at the, the, the typical lattice system that we might operate with. 
almost every lattice clock today operates with a one dimensional optical lattice where there's a, a standing wave um, in one dimension. And then we have weak uh, confinement in the radial axes, um, usually just from the, the Gaussian uh, profile of the laser used to create the, the lattice potential. The light shift itself can be written as uh, the sum of several different uh, atom light interactions. The most prominent one is from the E1 polarizability that are uh, the lattice operating at some wavelength of laser um, will couple to intermediate states uh, through E1 couplings and ultimately create a dipole potential that holds on to that traps our atoms. But there's also some much weaker interactions that end up playing an important role. There's also um, uh, magnetic dipole or electric quadrupole couplings to other intermediate states. And then there's also hyperpolarizability uh, interactions that scale higher order in the electric field. Now, for the most part, it's that E1 uh, coupling that creates the lattice potential for us that, that dictates how deep the trap is. But remember that we're operating these at the magic wavelength. And so even though th the trap itself is rather deep, we're canceling the light shifts um, to a very high level by operating at a magic wavelength where they're the same for the ground and the excited state. And we can typically do that cancellation at maybe the 10 part per billion level or so. And so that means that what historically, or excuse me, what uh, would otherwise be very small effects start playing a very prominent role otherwise. And I'll just remind you that again, we have very strong uh, confinement along one axis and then weak confinement along the two axes. So if you were to, I'll just take a step back actually, if you were to, to try to say, okay, well, here, here's the light atom interaction. What does this look like actually in our system? You could, you could basically do a harmonic expansion along both the strong and weak axes and you could write out what the, the, the light shift on the atoms is with an expression something like this. Let's just talk briefly about this. So first of all, this clock shift expressed in fractional frequency units um, depends on those uh, coupling terms that we just talked about, the E1, the M1, E2, and the hyperpolarizability. It also depends upon uh, the strength of the lattice potential itself, as uh, makes good sense. Uh, there's various uh, different terms, uh, uh, our trap depth u to the one half, to the one, three halves, or, or square power, depending upon the, the particular interaction that we're talking about. And then in this harmonic expansion, there's also these terms that ultimately depend upon what the, the motional quantum uh, number is for the atom bound in our lattice. Um, those are the three things that, um, that dictate what the light shift is on the atoms. And that the, the question that we ask ourselves often is, how can we make this light shift as small as possible? And how can we make its uncertainty as small as possible? Well, perhaps the easiest thing we could do is simply uh, trap the atoms in the weakest lattice possible. We still want the lattice to provide the important role of strongly confining the atoms in, in the Landicki regime. Uh, enabling long coherent spectroscopy. But if we can do that with a very weak lattice, then it will minimize uh, the light shifts that we have to worry about. So that motivates a lot of uh, what I'm about to talk about, which is trying to develop new laser cooling strategies so that we can go to ever more shallow lattices uh, while still realizing this, this strong confinement. There's an extra benefit from going to, to colder temperatures though, and that just, uh, uh, that just depends upon these, these motional quantum numbers here, so these N1 through N5 terms that depend upon the longitudinal or uh, radial motion of the atom. So this uh, right here, this, this plot on the lower right is showing uh, the thermally averaged uh, motional quantum number as a function of temperature. And you can see, especially in the case of the strong confinement axis along Z, that if you can get the atoms cold enough, uh, then you're rewarded with very weak, uh, very weak sensitivity to the details of the, of the motional, uh, the residual motion going on. In other words, we can very heavily populate the ground state. Uh, therefore, the uncertainty of having a few atoms that might be outside the ground state 
doesn't play a significant role. Um, we, can, we can really pin down these emotional uh, quantities with, with low uncertainty. And uh, for the weak confinement access, we don't quite have that same benefit, but it's still nominally a linear uh, effect so that if we can characterize a, a small temperature with uh, an uncertainty that would scale with its temperature, ultimately it would give us smaller uncertainty in our determination of these quantities as well. So all of this will help us to better pin down these lattice light shifts. So that's really motivating uh, the reason why we wanna do some better cooling. So most people that work with these two valence electrons will typically take advantage of at least two popular transitions for doing the laser cooling. The strong transition on the singlet series, and then the inner combination transition jumping between singlet and triplet uh, for doing some additional cooling. So this strong transition is good for capturing atoms from a, from a thermal source like an atomic beam, and this inner combination transition is good for cooling them down maybe to micro Kelvin temperatures where they can be trapped in a dipole trap like, a, like an optical lattice. More recently, we've also been doing uh, some sideband cooling on the clock transition itself, where we can take advantage of the fact that the clock transition has very high spectral resolution. We can drive um, red motional sidebands on the clock transition in order to specifically favor de-excitation of the motion. And along the strong confinement axis of our 1D lattice, this allows us to cool the atoms down to the ground state. And that can be seen here in a, a spectrum of the, um, of the clock transition, um, where we've scanned far enough in laser detuning to see some of the sideband spectra here. These, are, these sidebands here correspond to motional de-excitation or excitation. Uh, along the lattice axis. And you can see that as we cool the atoms down with the sideband cooling in the blue, we start to suppress uh, this, uh, this red detuned sideband, indicating that all of the atoms have moved to the ground state. All right, so this has been a, a nice technique for cooling the atoms uh, along this uh, a strong confinement axis, but it, it can't be used along weak confinement axis. And so what we've been uh, working on is trying to develop some technique that will allow us to achieve much colder temperatures in the weak axes of our 1D optical lattice. So as we consider different options we might have available to achieve better cooling, uh, thoughts took us back to um, some uh, work from the 90s uh, when for the first time uh, Raman cooling uh, techniques were developed. I'll just say a quick word about that to, um, uh, to remind you about how Raman processes typically work for cooling. Um, so this in particular, we're looking at a pulsed Raman cooling process where you might have a structure with two ground states and you can drive a Raman transition between those two ground states with very high coherence. So you can achieve very good resolution and doing so allows you as you tune the laser, you can address uh, different velocities within some kind of distribution, uh, moving them between these ground states. And then finally, you can excite them to a high line uh, state where they can experience dissipation and ultimately collect in some kind of dark state uh, where they can uh, finally get cooled to uh, deep temperatures in the nano Kelvin machine. So inspired by this, um, we wanted to uh, extend this technique to a one velocity uh, cooling. So here we're taking advantage of the fact that we have this, this great clock transition that also offers excellent coherence. Uh, we can use this to velocity select within a distribution and also try to create um, a population buildup in a dark state. So we'll, we'll do velocity selection on the clock transition and then we'll excite to this triplet D1 state where rapid decay back down to the ground state occurs and introduces dissipation where we can accumulate in, uh, in, the, um, in this uh, zero velocity dark state. Now, an important detail here is that these atoms are trapped in a magic wavelength optical lattice. Of course, that magic refers to the clock transition itself, meaning the clock, that the light shift for these two states are identical. So even though the atoms are strongly perturbed in our optical lattice, we can still use the clock transition to achieve velocity selection 
without having to worry about inhomogeneous light shifts due to uh, the, the confinement in the lattice. And that's an important detail for being able to realize deep cooling here. All right, uh, so to, to really emphasize the difference between uh, the strong confinement we have in one dimension of our optical lattice and the weak confinement, we'll just do laser spectroscopy first with a laser um, aligned along the lattice axis, and you can see the typical sideband structure in blue, or alternatively, we'll align the laser orthogonal to that axis, and we'll see this broad distribution reminiscent of a more traditional Doppler broaden profile. So here our goal is to try to address this, uh, this broaden profile and cool the atoms down, even though they're uh, only weakly confined in our 1D optical lattice. So again, we'll do this by um, uh, choosing uh, detunings on the clock transition in order to um, select particular velocities. And we'll do that over a range of different uh, positive and negative velocities, intentionally leaving a dark state near zero where the population can accumulate after quenching the population up to this other intermediate state. All right, so uh, without getting in too many of the experimental details, um, this is normally what that technique can realize in one dimension. Um, so uh, in a, a period of a few tens of milliseconds, doing this velocity selection and then uh, mixing, excuse me, interleaving that with uh, quenching, um, you can achieve deep cooling from the kind of 10 microkelvin level down to subrecoil temperatures in the hundreds of nanokelvin on the time scale of these 10 microseconds, excuse me, 10 milliseconds. What this looks like here in terms of uh, the frequency spectrum uh, is shown in the bottom right. So for a range of different uh, lattice trap depths from about 50 recoil up to 500 recoil, um, you can see what the resulting um, um, velocity distribution in the frequency domain looks like. Um, what we start with is shown here in red, and basically we're getting about an order of magnitude narrowing in, uh, in the spectral width, which corresponds to about two orders of magnitude in reduction of the, the, the temperature. Right? So this works very good in, in, in 1D. In order to actually realize good 3D cooling, we apply this weak uh, radial cooling along two dimensions, and then we interleave that with our sideband cooling technique that I mentioned earlier uh, for good cooling of the strong confinement axis. And we'll interleave those multiple times because generally cooling in one axis can introduce some small residual heating in the other axes. So by interleaving a few different times over a time scale corresponding to maybe uh, a, a couple hundred milliseconds, um, we can, uh, we can start to get uh, good, efficient three-dimensional cooling. And maybe the most interesting way to look at that is by looking at the longitudinal sideband spectra of uh, our, our lattice-trapped atoms on the clock transition. So again, this is much like the sideband spectra that we were looking at earlier. Uh, here in red is what we might start out with after doing the more traditional cooling and loading into the optical lattice. Now, important detail here is that even though uh, we're doing spectroscopy along the strong confinement of the 1D lattice, recall that there's much weaker confinement along the other uh, axes and atoms with high radial motion will in general experience the lower intensity associated with the Gaussian profile, the laser field. And so that basically equates to a weaker standing wave and thus a lower trap frequency that those atoms might experience. So as a result, this longitudinal sideband feature is typically smeared out and broadened towards zero detuning. And, and this is associated with the, the, the extra um, radial energy of the atoms in the lattice. But once, uh, once uh, uh, deeply cooling them in all three dimensions, that gets tightened up and you can see a very narrow feature um, that we've really efficiently cooled the atoms, not just to the ground state of the longitudinal band, but also um, really cool them deeply along those weak axes as well. So it's kind of fun to take advantage of the fact that uh, 
we can select which axes we'd like to cool on, whether that's along the, the lattice axis Z or along the weak axis X and Y. Uh, and so we can, uh, this uh, image of different sideband features kind of plays to that idea that we can kind of choose where we'd like to cool. So this red sideband feature here shows if we were to introduce no cooling at all, we have that, that, that thermally broadened sideband feature. Now, if we, if we elect to do only cooling along the strong confinement axis of the lattice along Z, well, then we get a feature here in brown where it's, it's narrower than the red one because we've removed a lot of radial energy. However, it still broadens in, it smears in towards zero detuning due to the fact that we have a fairly deep trap here and there is anharmonicity in the higher line um, uh, motional bands of the lattice, right? This is not a perfect harmonic oscillator. And so the higher bands will in general correspond to, uh, uh, to lower trap frequencies, to lower different trap frequencies. Alternatively, if we choose to leave uh, the longitudinal temperatures uh, where they are and only introduce cooling along the radial axes, you can see features like this green structure where now um, you've completely, uh, you, you've removed enough radial energy that you can completely resolve the individual lattice bands, um, in this case, uh, for a fairly deep potential of 500 recoil. There's, you know, almost a dozen of these different lattice bands, but they're completely separated. This might be useful in some quantum simulation approaches where you would want to take advantage of all of these different bands, but be able to treat them in an independent way. And finally, of course, if we do the 3D cooling, uh, you, can, uh, you can collapse it all into a, a single um, uh, narrow band, side band structure. All right. Um, so benefiting from the cold temperatures, now what we'll do is we will uh, load a very deep lattice, we'll cool them down, and then we'll adiabatically ramp uh, our lattice down to shallow uh, depths and see how many atoms we can hold on to. And if we were to do this without any new cooling, uh, we'd actually start to lose atoms uh, relatively quickly and might have significant loss even down at tens of, of recoil or, or 100 recoil. But now in blue, if we apply this full 3D cooling, you can see that we're just much better at hanging on to these atoms at trap depths even below 10 recoil. And so this is kind of accomplishing the goal that we originally set out to, was to load them in a weak lattice where we still get strong confinement, but the light shifts will simply be smaller because the, 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 the lattice is shallower. On the right, we're looking at what the temperatures are uh, after we do that adiabatic ramping. You can see that um, radially we'll get down to temperatures corresponding to um, you know, maybe 20 nano Kelvin or so. Uh, longitudinally, that quite we, we can't quite measure that just because we're taking advantage of sideband spectroscopy to measure the temperature. And right about uh, 12 or 13 recoil, there ceases to be an excited lattice band. And so we can't drive that, that transition at all. Okay, so indeed, at this point now, the lattice can be sufficiently small, uh, sufficiently shallow that we can observe some prominent tunneling effect. And in this case, our lattice is, is lined along gravity. Uh, and so the tunneling phenomenon mostly manifests itself as block oscillations. And so here you can see uh, the block sidebands uh, corresponding to um, uh, the energy non-degeneracy between adjacent lattice sites. And in this case as well, we, we, we barely still have one excited lattice band that we can excite to. And that lattice band, you, you also can excite block oscillations there so that you're really getting kind of any combination of these excitations shown here, um, either between ground and, and excited motional bands or between higher or lower adjacent lattice sites. Uh, so fortunately, what we might do then is we might choose to operate at a lattice depth uh, somewhere in this vicinity where the, the tunneling is still relatively weak. It gets much stronger as we go to, to shallower lattices, but again, the, the light shifts are relatively small. Okay, so I'll take a quick uh, pause there, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that before we turn our attention to a couple of other details. Yeah, Andrew, we actually got a 
bunch of questions so i'll try to sort them you know along the timing i mean like uh, along the topics you covered um maybe the very first one was with respect to the slides at the beginning so there you showed the prominent triplet p1 state um the triplet p0 and one question is is the triplet p2 state which is also in showing up in strontium, ytterbium, also potentially useful for an optical clock? Um, it, it certainly could be. Um, and in some of the original uh, proposals, um, theoretical proposals for some of the most useful transitions in the alkali nurse, um, the triplet P2 state was definitely talked about. Um, once the optical lattice clock architecture really took hold, um, triplet B0 was quickly identified as the best choice, and that's just because it's a J equals zero state. Um, and as a result of that, the light shifts on, the, um, on that excited clock state uh, are normally just scalar light shifts. And so you don't have to worry about geometrical or polarization details like you would for the triplet P2 state where you could have very significant vector or tensor light shifts. So definitely the triplet P0 um, has some advantage in terms of simplicity, um, but um, in situations where you might be able to navigate those complexities, triplet P2 remains interesting. And indeed, there have been proposals more recently at using triplet P2 or some other uh, states as well that, that have non-zero J uh, for making high resolution clock states that would be more sensitive to looking at alpha variation, for example. Yes, and another question we got in the context of the BBR discussion. Um, someone is asking, is it realistic to operate a lattice clock in a cryogenic environment? And I think you, you flashed a slide where you actually were referring to the Tokyo uh, effort, so yeah, maybe. Uh, yes, it, it, it is realistic, and in fact, it's been done uh, by the, you know, by the Tokyo group. Um, so uh, several years ago now, they uh, loaded a lattice and then they moved, they shuttled the, lattice, the, the atoms in a moving lattice into a cryogenic environment. And uh, if we get to that part, uh, maybe have a few more words to say about that. Um, based on how things are going, we probably won't get there, but maybe in the, in the final questions session, we can talk more about it. But definitely, it can be done, and it's been useful, and I think it, it continues to offer additional utility looking ahead to the future. And then uh, there were questions in the context of uh, gravity, measuring gravity with clocks. Um, um, so you were talking about seismic, likely you were talking about measuring the geoid. And one question is that seismic activity will, will affect this. Is there a typical time scale for this? Um, is this something that could also be measured with a lattice clock, optical clock? Yeah, so there's maybe a lot of details that could go along with that question. So the, the concept of, of the, the geoid is um, defined as a kind of a static uh, quantity. It's averaged over tidal effects, for example. And the lattice clock, if it could achieve very high uh, precision at short time scales, certainly would uh, allow the opportunity to study some of these dynamic quantities, including the, the daily variation of, of tidal effects. Um, th there's other dynamic, um, interesting um, geophysical phenomenon associated with volcanoes or earthquakes. That, that, that could potentially also be studied with this type of relativistic geodesy. And, and, and this is an area that, again, um, some folks are, are really interested and excited that as these clocks continue to mature and get higher precision, as they get moved out of the lab so that you can take them to geodetically interesting locations, you'll be able to uh, complement some of the existing technologies and, and, and maybe study more precisely some of these effects. Yes, and then transitioning to, um, well, the discussion about the temperature in the lattice motional states, we got one question. Um, given, given the higher occupation number and, you know, the dependence, uh, temperature dependence of radial motion and shifts, 
Um, would it be beneficial to go to a 3D lattice, or is there obvious downs? Are there obvious downsides compared to a, a 1D system? Yeah, that's also a, a really good question as well. So definitely, um, a big benefit of the 3D lattice is that you would have strong confinement along all axes, and that uh, definitely you would be able to, using some existing techniques, cool them all down to the ground state, and that would be useful. You won't completely get around the uniformity problem, though, because probably you'll be loading uh, lattice sites that are distributed throughout the, the Gaussian profile of your laser fields, and so you will still have in non-uniformity in you know, how strongly the atoms are trapped from one lattice site to, to the next. And so that's a lingering complication. Um, but another issue is that the 3D lattice also introduces some complexities associated with polarization, and, and this is connected to a vector and tensor light shifts. I, I think maybe, maybe I advertise that the triplet P0 state was nice because it's free of vector and tensor light shifts. And to lowest order, that's true. Uh, but again, once you start canceling uh, the, the dominant E1 uh, uh, light interaction, uh, there's some low line uh, weaker effects. And just, you know, the triplet B0 state has weak mixture of other states in there that do introduce some vector and tensor shifts. And the 3D lattice can be more sensitive to some of those effects. So there are some metrological benefits uh, of the 1D lattice where you could just have a simpler uh, you know, optical system. Um, that being said, I think both the 1D and 3D lattice, I think remain uh, kind of interesting systems. And I think both would definitely be capable of 10 to the minus 18 performance. Right now, most of the momentum is uh, with the 1D lattice. That's where most of these clocks uh, are being developed and operated. Well, I guess we don't want to take all the time for questions. Maybe just a very short one. Um, I'll combine it into one question. So how, how lossy are these cooling processes at the end? Um, and um, do you always end up really with a, a thermal distribution? Is Are you worried that the final sample is, is non-thermal uh, along different dimensions? Yeah, so how lossy is this? So... Um, the dominant loss process that we have is, so we do velocity selection on the clock transition, and then we excite it up to triplet D1 where it's quenched down to the ground state. Uh, unfortunately, that loss process, excuse me, that um, uh, spontaneous decay doesn't always go back to the ground state. Um, so we can get uh, a small amount of decay uh, down to this triplet P2 state that we just spoke about. Um, the good news is that the branching ratios uh, strongly discourage uh, that particular decay. So it's at the level of, uh, you know, a percent or so. Nevertheless, when you cycle the, you know, this process many times, you can accumulate a reasonable amount of population into triple P2, where you could either try to uh, repump that, uh, that population and avoid this loss, which we haven't done. Um, and you would need to do that quickly because that state is, is not well trapped in the optical lattice for us. Um, or you could just accept it as a loss, which is what we've done thus far. And typically that loss might be on the order of a factor of two or three associated with that, uh, that optical pumping process. Uh, we definitely see non-thermal distributions um, when we you know, do this cooling um, and for the most part, we're not overly concerned about it because um, even though it's maybe not thermal, it's sufficiently cold that we have still a, a very uniform distribution. And um, because we can still take advantage of these lower lattice steps, uh, we're still able to, uh, in principle, significantly reduce some of the lattice light shifts and the uncertainties associated with those. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, in the interest of time, let's let's continue with your talk. Okay, and then Christian, could you just say about what time would you like us to be completely done with the presentation and maybe just be wrapping up with some questions? Yeah, well, so the setup is for one hour. Um, um, and some people might need to leave. So 
you know, try to 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 get the important things in the in the one hour time frame. Okay. All right. So I'll um, so I've talked now uh, about this this clock transition based cooling that allowed us to go deeply sub recoil into the nano Kelvin regime and the benefit that that's had for the the lattice. As it turns out, we actually explored a couple of different cooling mechanisms um, and, and, and experimented with a few to see which could give us the best results. So I'll say a few words about an alternative strategy that we also explored based upon a Sisyphus cooling mechanism. So here the idea is rather than introducing radial uh, laser fields from the clock transition itself in order to do velocity selection, we're gonna replace those with um, that 1388 nanometer light, which I, I don't think I said the wavelength before, but that's what connects uh, the excited triplet P0 state up to this triplet D1 state. It will be not on resonance, um, um, slightly detuned from that, and in, in general will create a standing wave potential of that 1388 light. And then we'll still have some excitation of the clock transition along the lattice axis itself. So the idea um, here was inspired by um, a laser cooling proposal from a decade ago from the JQI group um, for, for cooling um, anti-hydrogen. And we've tried to kind of take it and make it work for ytterbium here. So the basic strategy is as follows. So we introduce this 1388 standing wave that is uh, essentially our Sisyphus potential. It induces a light shift on the triplet P0 state. And, uh, and then we excite atoms from the ground state up to triplet P0. Because the light shift um, from our standing wave is rather significant, we're only able to excite on the clock transition really when we're at the bottom of this Sisyphus potential where there's um, a very small light shift. And then the atoms uh, move through the potential. And as they get higher and higher up, recall that this potential is formed with this laser. And as you go to uh, higher intensities, it will simply drive that transition where you can experience uh, decay and, and dissipation back down to the ground state. So that means that the atom likes to leave the potential uh, near, the, near the antinodes um, where it likes to enter into the potential uh, near, near the nodes. And so this uh, introduces a Sisyphus cooling process that we can take advantage of to remove large quantities of energy with each cooling cycle. All right, so for time, maybe I won't say too much about the details. Turns out that if you operate close to resonance on this transition, you can get a fairly deep potential and you can efficiently cool the atoms in free space to enhance your loading into an optical lattice. Or alternatively, you can move to further detuning where once the atoms are already trapped in the optical lattice, um, you can realize um, deep cooling, in fact, below the recoil limit. Um, and so there's some, some dark state, excuse me, some dark state mechanisms that allow us to actually, in this 1D case, reach below um, the recoil cooling limit uh, also for the Sisyphus mechanism. Um, it turns out as well that this cooling actually works well in three dimensions. Even though our Sisyphus potential is only in two dimensions, the light shift that gets induced with this, uh, with, uh, with this coupling is sufficiently large that we actually effectively drive um, some red sidebands on the clock transition. And so we end up getting cooling in all three dimensions, you can see the radial cooling is seen again by tightening up the width of these sideband features, and the longitudinal cooling is seen by the reduction in the amplitude of the red detuned uh, longitudinal sideband as we move down to the ground state. Okay, um, so that's all I'll say there. Uh, maybe for our, our, our last few moments, I'll talk about now that we've got these shallow lattices, um, we can really take advantage of a few additional effects to try to help with another important systematic effect, and that is collisions between the atoms within a lattice site. So generally speaking, we like to operate uh, the lattice uh, with large atom numbers, and that's so that the, the standard quantum limit for our measurements uh, 
uh, can be uh, correspond to very high signal to noise. Uh, this is reducing the, the so-called quantum projection noise. However, at the same time, if we have high atom number density, this can correspond to relatively strong interactions between the atoms, and that in turn leads to collisional shifts. And even though I mentioned earlier that we're able to suppress these largely using Fermi statistics, uh, nevertheless, uh, they're, they're, they're still there. There are lingering uh, P wave interactions uh, that, that, that play a role. And in general, they're, they're difficult to control. And so we like to eliminate them as much as possible. So one, one thing that we've we looked at doing is now that we're loading these very shallow lattice, can we take advantage of tunneling mechanisms in order to uh, reduce the atom number density while maintaining a very high atom number? And so this is taking advantage of a delocalization effect that has been explored in other contexts uh, like um, gravimetry or atom interferometry. The idea that can you induce tunneling um, in order to get the, the, the distribution of atoms to spread out along the lattice. Now, generally, we operate our uh, optical lattice along gravity, and that's intentionally done to introduce non-degeneracy, making tunneling process off resonance. And so it strongly suppresses tunneling between lattice sites. And that's good for laser spectroscopy so that we don't have to worry about tunneling as a, as a residual atomic motion that, that could uh, introduce some, some, some shift shifts or maybe even some broadening. But here we're going to use some phonon excitation at the block frequency to once again make the tunneling mechanisms resonant to intentionally drive them. We would do this prior to laser spectroscopy in order to distribute the atoms, and then we'd stop the process, uh, once again, discouraging tunneling uh, with the non-degeneracy and, and then do laser spectroscopy. That's kind of the idea. All right, so we'll achieve uh, this phonon excitation by amplitude modulating the lattice in order to um, encourage tunneling between the lattice sites. Um, and the uh, modulation depth of our lattice is given here by alpha. Of course, one thing that we have to worry about as we go to shallow lattices, obviously tunneling is, is uh, stronger at the most shallow lattice we could, we could operate with, but we do have to worry about losses from the lattice at the, at the shallowest case due to landau zener tunneling, where the atom will basically get driven to an untrapped state and then get lost to the lattice. So what you're looking at here is uh, the loss of population in our lattice as a function of the, the trap depth that we adiabatically ramp uh, uh, an initially loaded lattice down to. And you're, for the different colors, you're seeing that for the ground lattice band and then the N equals one, two, and three lattice bands here. And so for the ground band, once we get down to you know, something like seven or eight recoil, we start losing uh, some of the population due to these landau zener losses. Um, and of course, uh, higher for some of the higher emotional bands. Now, an important detail here is that we, of course, we wanna get strong tunneling in order to delocalize our sample within the lattice as much as possible. But we also wanna minimize the losses associated with landau zener tunneling. And it turns out that our excited lattice bands can help us realize a better compromise between those two quantities. So what you're looking at here is the, the, the theoretical tunneling rate as a function of trap depth, again here for different, uh, for different lattice bands, where we've um, intentionally applied a constraint. And that constraint is that as we amplitude modulate the lattice, we don't want to amplitude modulate it so deeply that we will um, uh, introduce very strong landau zener losses. Uh, and so uh, as we go to shallower lattices, we will reduce the amount of modulation depth that we apply to minimize these losses. So you can see that at very deep lattices, you discourage tunneling in general, and so you don't get very strong tunneling. But it, it, as you go more to shallower sides, you can also discourage this process simply because you're modulating the lattice uh, more weakly. And in general, we can strike a better compromise by using an excited lattice band 
relative to the ground band. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Oops, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, do, use adiabatic rapid passage to, to drive atoms. Once we've cooled them down to the ground band, we'll drive them to an excited band and then um, modulate the lattice in order to induce this coherent delocalization. So I'm almost wrapped up here there. So in the end, this is kind of the results that we can see where we do, uh, we, we use the uh, N equals two excited lattice band with a 40 recoil lattice step. And then we do this amplitude modulation for delocalization at a one second time scale. That, um, this is basically the sample that we start out with, just having loaded into the lattice after our normal cooling processes and then after delocalization. So you can see that we're able to extend the distribution along the lattice axis by a factor of seven. And that corresponds to you know, the same kind of reduction um, roughly in the atom number density without really any significant loss in the atom number. Here we do lose about 10 or 20 percent through the delocalization process. Then finally, we take advantage of this effect. We showcase one of the benefits of this delocalization uh, by by illustrating that one negative effect that we can avoid is when you move atoms into the excited uh, clock state, triplet B0, uh, there are inelastic collision processes that the atoms can experience there where they can be entirely lost from the lattice. Uh, and that, that's been measured before and is, is a known effect. And that would discourage you from operating with a very dense uh, atom number um, however, here uh, we, we can look at this, this extra loss process just by looking at the uh, a number of atoms that remain as a function of hold time in our lattice. And under a normal situation, you can see that there's kind of some prominent inelastic losses that occur at short times. But once we delocalize the sample, reducing the density, we basically re remove the inelastic losses at all. The same uh, would be true of the elastic uh, interactions as well, ultimately minimizing the light shift. All right, uh, with that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the very end. And uh, I wanna thank uh, the folks uh, who have uh, uh, worked hard on these experiments and, and have really uh, realized some of the results that I've showcased today, uh, our team at NIST. Um, as well as um, you know, acknowledge some of the funding support that we've received that, that also makes this possible. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, we've got a few more questions. Actually, uh, the first one referring to the part before the break, which was uh, where we're showing these Bloch oscillations. Um, Question is, why were there only nearest neighbor Bloch oscillation sidebands in the spectra um, at shallow depths? Um, in principle, you could move several steps, uh, uh, like two sides up and down, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and it, it, I mean, in principle, they're there. They're just strongly attenuated um, below the, the signal to noise of that measure. So maybe I'll just hop back there so we can look at them. Um, one important detail, and in fact, um, you know, a lot of these block oscillations and delocalization has been looked at before in the context of gravimetry using ultracold strontium. And, and, and maybe one that's familiar with that might also be accustomed to seeing some of these higher um, block bands. And uh, I'll just mention that here, our ytterbium is really heavy. Uh, we've got 171 nucleons. So it's much heavier. And so in general, the tunneling processes are, are weaker than they would be uh, for a much lighter species. So um, at this relatively shallow depth, we can easily see these prominent first order block sidebands, uh, but the second ones are still strongly suppressed. And we'd have to go to, to even shallower lattices before we start seeing those. And that's different than it would be for a, uh, for, for a lighter element. Yes, and then regarding, um, you know, like the, the delocalization you discussed, um, the clock laser wavelength and the lattice magic wavelength are incommensurate. So does that uh, different phase uh, that the clock atoms experience, does it give rise to shifts or broadening um, when you do spectroscopy in that delocalized system? 
Yeah, so um, I guess I'll, so this delocalization process, it all happens before any laser spectroscopy would occur. So we, we spread the distribution out. It's kind of like a state preparation step. Um, and then once that's complete, the modulation is terminated. And then at that point, laser spectroscopy occurs as normal. And so um, th there, the, the tunneling is once again, strongly suppressed during, uh, during the laser spectroscopy. So you don't need to worry about that phase shift that would occur during the tunneling. So I think I understood the question there. If I haven't, please um, maybe help me out. Yes, well, um, in the interest of time, we're running a little bit beyond 2 p.m. Maybe we'll wrap up with one last question, which is, um, uh, you know, you mentioned these two body collision losses. Now, someone is asking, um, since you use excited bands, do you need to worry about other decays? I assume like decay back to emotional lower lying states. Yeah, so we don't, um, we, we do see uh, some small loss uh, in the delocalization process. Uh, like I mentioned, that could be at the 10 or 20% level. Um, we have not observed any significant um, decay back down to the ground state. Although were we to do that, as soon as we're done, we actually uh, will typically just ARP the uh, population back down to the ground state anyways. And so really the, the, I guess the significant drawback would be that those atoms that might have experienced that would not have had as much opportunity to delocalize. But that would be a very small number. As I said, we haven't we haven't really observed any prominent effect there. So that's not something that we're terribly worried about. And again, once that process is done, we stop the modulation, and so there's no more tunneling going on. Um, and and then we do the laser spectroscopy. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, let me advertise the Lamos talk in two weeks. It's going to be given by Mac Kira from the University of Michigan. With that, yeah, thanks again. And um, applause. Great talk. Thanks, Andrew. See you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, actually, can I, so I, I'll follow up with it about the delocalization. So do, do you do something once you turn off the modulation to like project the atom into a specific site or is it still kind of is the wave function still spread out you know because that i'm a little bit confused i guess about if like suppose the atoms actually still delocalized when you when you probe it with the light even if you're not modulating or allowing it to tunnel anymore it it's, can still be delocalized right so do you do something to project it or maybe the clock itself projects it uh or how, how do I think about it? Yeah, so uh, I guess you're still worried about you're worried about lingering coherence um, that might have is in my understanding you right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean basically like even when you're you know when you see these one year stark sidebands, it means that or the block bands, it means the atom has some finite you know population on a neighboring site or something, right? And now if you're driving it so that it can spread out over 1800 sites or, or whatever, mm -hmm. like is the atom, you know, when we did this measurement in, in horizontal lattices, like, you know, we saw block oscillations where the atom really is like delocalized. It's really experiencing a bunch of the lattice at once. And so I'm just asking, I guess, you know, is there something that actually kind of projecting the atom so that once you've spread it out, it then collapses and okay, one atom's here, one atom's here, one atom's there, one's there, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe that that detail wasn't wasn't clear. So we can do things like so other state preparation um, steps that we might include would be some of this final stage of cooling. Oh, sure. Or um, maybe some of the optical pumping to you know a specific state, and, sure. and 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 that all would be an incoherent process and would 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 destroy any of that coherence beforehand. Got it. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, as soon as you scatter a photon, yeah, the, the atoms in one place. Got it. Um, great. Well, thanks for a great talk. I really enjoyed it.
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Maybe one one quick more other comment. Um, the um, I don't know if you watch the attendance, like you know the number of participants. It really turns out these days that COVID is over. A lot of people actually watch it later on YouTube in an asynchronous fashion. So it's even though you know there's not a thousands of people watching it live. It's still, I think, a great service for particularly those, I don't know, in parts of the world where uh, in-person talks are not uh, not so easy. Yeah, and I, I, I think I went into that real, I, I've seen that the attendance maybe, yeah, hasn't been the same here as it used to be, but but yeah, I, I'm, it seems like still there's been lots of views on some of the, the YouTube and stuff. So I think that's great. I think that's still wonderful. So. And to be honest, I, I don't think I was even paying attention to how many were there. So if it was a tiny number, I'm oblivious at this point. <laughs> no, no, it's pretty, pretty standard, but it, it is true that it's like, it was like 30, 30 people watching or something, which is kind of a lot lower than it used to be. But then, as you said, it gets like hundreds of views over the next week, you know, so it's sort of, it's a, it's sort of a funny thing. We hear from a lot of people that they prefer to watch it kind of at their leisure and they can pause it and things like that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. You know, unfortunately, we didn't get to the transportable thing. Toby keeps telling me about the uh, exciting things, or he's also saying, yeah, at some point we'll, you know, we'll go around. Maybe we'll come to CSU. That's an hour, I guess, from Boulder. That would be exciting. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. I feel the same way, or or maybe, uh, you know, somewhere even a little further away someday it would be great. So, <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. You know, so we recently we've been, you know, we just kind of got to kind of full construction operation of it. So we've been practicing, like literally last week, we had the FedEx guy show up, pick it up and drive it out on the highway and then come back just so we could kind of see like what terrible stuff might happen when we do that. And then we're, we'll, we'll be headed to see you in a couple of weeks just to kind of set up there briefly. And later, right now, in a month or two, we should actually be headed out to the East Coast, out to Washington, D.C. So the hope is that we'll be able to take this thing far away and be able to do some fun stuff with it. So we'll see what the future holds. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. That's, that's amazing. You've done a like a systematic evaluation of it and everything already or? No, not really. To be honest, for um, for these first um, measurements that we're doing away from NIST, it's almost entirely focusing on um, either stability or some of the, the phase noise spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, th that's one of the first things on our list is to work through a, a comprehensive uncertainty budget. Yeah. Sure. I, I love the thought, the, the thought that a uh, you know, FedEx guy rings the doorbell and delivers a full optical lattice clock. That's... <laughs> All right. Well, I, I actually have to run. So thanks a lot, right. Andrew. Again. Thanks to both of you. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that was really great. Okay. Bye.